Bear, take me to the bottom of the ocean with you. Bear, swim with me. Bear, put your arms around me, enclose me, swim down, down, down with me. Bear, make me comfortable in the world at last. Give me your skin. Bear, I want nothing but this from you. Oh, thank you, Bear. I will keep you safe from strangers and peering eyes forever. Bear, give up your humility. You are not a humble beast. You think your own thoughts. Tell them to me. Bear, I cannot command you to love me, but I think you love me. What I want is for you to continue to be, and to be something to me. No more. Bear. Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we are looking at Marion Engel's Canadian classic short novel, Bear. Mm-hmm. And I, I gather this has also been called the most controversial novel ever written in Canada. And I mean, I think that's pretty fair. If there's one thing you know about this novel, it's that in the novel, there's a woman and she has sex with a bear. And if that's not the sort of discussion you're in the mood for having right now, that's okay. That's your content warning. That <laughs> will come up. But yeah, that is what this novel is about. And it has gained a certain amount of notoriety. But the other thing that I know about it is that everybody I knew who had read it loved this book, thought this book was really interesting. Yeah, this is my first time reading it, but I also had heard from friends that this is a book that they thought was extraordinary. Um, so it was with a lot of anticipation that I came to it. Well, this was also my first time reading it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was really interesting and, and terrific. What did you think? I- I admired its craft enormously, and I was drawn into it. Um, it's beautifully written. It's short, almost has like a, I want to say a fable-like quality to it. Like, I don't mean that it's just figurative or allegorical, because it feels very real in all kinds of ways, right? Very visceral and real and, and grounded in all kinds of ways. And, and it was a book that left me very unsettled. And, and And I don't mean just because of like the bear sex, though that did... I found myself wondering about agency and who is who is doing what to whom and and there was all kinds of troublesomeness about that. But then also this takes place in a remote region of northern Ontario and the ways in which it handles the history of settler colonialism and the ongoing presence of what the book calls Indians, so indigenous people. I I was both really interested by it and also like, I felt like there were layers here, only some of which I was able to peel away. And which is strange. It's such a short, little, tight little book, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm not trying to say that it's perfect or its politics are perfect or anything like that. But it is really interesting and compelling reading, including several of the things that are somewhat unsettling. But it's also pushing ideas in interesting directions that are that are even today worth thinking about, even if, you know, there's some criticisms or, or some you know different thinking that you might bring to the book now. I hope that made sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not perfect. No book ever is going to be, but I think it was still worth reading and, and definitely gave me some stuff to think about. Yeah. I was struck by like, you know, the, the book is 45 years old this year, like since it was published. And it, it, f- even though it's clear, it very much feels of its time, like we'll be talking about the 70s and the kinds of things that are going on and the context for reading this book. It also felt very, I don't know if fresh is the right word, like it felt like it was very much speaking to things that a lot of people are thinking about now. So whether it's around gender identity, whether it's about the human and the animal, whether it's about landscape and identity, whether it's about the place of history, whether it's about written versus oral forms of knowledge, like a lot of things that people are thinking about now are also being thought about here. So it feels distant in time, but also I thought very close. Yeah, very relevant. Well, uh, you know, it was relatable. Okay, sure. (laughs) (laughs) But you're absolutely right. It's an extremely 70s feeling book at the same time. And and again, not feeling dated, but of an era. Uh uh Maybe it would have felt dated 20 years ago. I don't know. But now it just feels like it's from this particular era and and has that flavor to it. Well, that dated quality, I feel it's like it happens in two very specific ways in this book. First, in terms of gender and in particular women's liberation, right? That's a phrase we haven't heard for a little while. But that was the way of thinking about um, the place of women in society and the kinds of potential that existed, right? So there's a whole discourse of the mid seventies to think about there, but then there was also, I think, very much the nineteen seventies context of Canadian national identity, right? And that's a really 
potent moment to be thinking about that in terms of what's going on over in Quebec with the way nationalism is playing out over there, the ways in which Canadian national identity is being defined at once in relationship to Britain, right, that colonial framework, uh, but also relative to the U.S. increasingly, right, in the 1970s, right? It's the place that people would go, uh, draft dodgers would go, right, from the Vietnam War. So there's, so national identity is playing out here in a way that um, I think we have to work to kind of uh, remember what was the frame of reference there and how were Canadian writers trying to articulate what it meant to be a Canadian writer, what Canadian literature might look like. Um, and particularly like English Canada, Ontario literature, because I really want to be mindful of the fact when we talk about Canadian literature, like there's a lot of variety in that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we should say a little bit about the author. Yeah, no, I'm happy to say a little bit about her. I, I didn't know very much about Marianne Engel before, you know, we came to this book. Um, she's someone who sadly had a relatively short career. Um, she died at a relatively young age of cancer in 1985, um, uh, born in 1933. Um, she had done her MA in Canadian literature at McGill under Hugh McLennan, um, the writer of Two Solitudes. So she's clearly somebody who already in her sort of intellectual formation was thinking a lot about Canadian national identity, the different aspects of it, reflecting on this. And again, doing an MA in Canadian literature pretty early on when that was emerging as a field of study. Uh, so you got to place her in that context. Yeah. For those who don't know, Two Solitudes is a quote unquote classic Canadian novel, one of the great Canadian novels, so to speak. Although, again, people who I know who've read this novel have not had such kind words to say for it, but it's a big <laughs> allegory about Anglophone Canada and Francophone Canada relationships. And it's it, it's very seriously thinking about the Canadian situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, and it puts uh, this novel, Bear, in an interesting context because Bear is engaging with national identity in a way that I don't know, it's very multi-layered, I think, relative to what you see in McLennan. Anyways, so she was married to Howard Engel, who was a mystery novelist and a radio producer, and they had children separated in 1975. Again, that women's liberation context um, is not irrelevant here. In other words, women getting divorced is a thing that had been happening before the mid-70s, but it plays out socially in a slightly different way once you get into the 70s. And it's not too long before the novel, and she herself referred to the ways in which the novel uh, – grew out of or emerged from uh, a complicated time in her own life. She was an important figure in Canadian literature as well, um, in a sort of professional way. She started and was the first chair of the Writers Union of Canada um, in 1973. So she was somebody who was involved in shaping that field in professional ways as well as through her own writing. So in 1976, Bear is published, and not without a lot of difficulty. Her publisher initially rejected it because it was too short, too weird, and too unmarketable. And clearly, you know, wrong, right? But um, but it's certainly weird. Um, and Robertson Davies, an important Canadian writer, uh, knew this was a really important piece of work. He championed it and helped her, I think, get another publisher for it. The book won the Governor General's Award, so it was recognized really quickly as an important piece of literature um, on the scene. Um, and we'll talk more about this aspect of the book, too. In an interview that Marion Engel did uh, on the CBC was sometime after Bear came out, she said that she had been partly inspired by the First Nations legend of the Bear Princess, as recorded by the folklorist Marius Borbeau. And, um, and so she was kind of explicitly acknowledging not adaptation, but like responding to indigenous story. And, and I, the reason I feel like that's worth flagging is that it's really important to note this, this is, this book is not kind of adapting, uh, an indigenous or first nations story, but, but her encounter with that work had something to do with the kind of thinking she was doing in this novel. And I feel like that's interesting and worth thinking about more. Yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about that and the, and the other literature about bears that are inspiring this as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. I'm going to tell you about the plot of the book. If you haven't read it yet, there will, I guess, be spoilers, but not really. You don't have to worry about spoilers for this book, I don't think. There's just that one really, you know. Yeah, the big one which everybody knows about. <laughs> So here goes. Lou is the name of our main character, and she works at the Historical Institute in Toronto. And the Institute has just received an unusual bequest, a house, and an island even, that the house is on, in northern Ontario. The house was built in the mid-19th century by an Englishman, Colonel Carey, who saw an island on the map and had the capital R romantic notion that this would be his. Lou heads north to spend the summer living at the house and cataloging the library, hoping to find documents that will help tell the history of the area. But the library turns out to mostly have pretty ordinary 19th century books. But also, a bit of a surprise. A big surprise. A bear. An actual bear. Tied up in the backyard. Who will also need tending to. 
the original Colonel Carey had a bear, it seems, and so did all of his descendants. So let's be clear here. It's a bear. It's a bear. It's not an anthropomorphic bear. It's not a talking bear. It's just a bear. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the summer, Lou becomes more and more comfortable being around the bear, unchaining it from its post and going swimming with it and letting it spend time in the house with her at night. And eventually, unexpectedly, she falls in love with the bear and her increasing intimacy with the bear turns sexual. Her enamored intoxication with the bear gets more and more intense until finally, at the end of the summer, the bear seems ready to try to actually mount her, which she is excited for at this point. But the bear claws at her back instead, leaving a massive gash. Summer is over, and while she still loves the bear, the intoxication is then gone, and Lou knows she needs to move on with her life. She quickly finishes up the catalog and heads for home, planning to leave her job and to start a new life. I mean, it's a really simple story, but there's so many layers in it and so many, like, s- sort of sub-themes that are emerged. Like, she's in a library, as you mentioned, right, that she's cataloging and dealing with. Um, but but notes sort of fall out of the books. They're almost like, I don't know, leaves of the Sybil. Iraq. Like, on the one hand, they're like just real notes somebody left in these books over time, right? Colonel Carey had left these handwritten notes, all of them about bears in the books. Um, but they appear at... At, at certain t- at opportune times and in and junctures and like I said, there's kind of almost oracular kind of quality. So so it's a book that has a like so I mean by saying it's almost like fable like because it's got this very simple plot um, and yet all this enigmatic apparatus kind of. Yeah, the notes that fall out about the bear are really interesting, and they are largely notes that Colonel Carey would have taken while researching bears. It seems like he had a strong fascination for them and wanted to collect, rather like the very opening of Moby Dick, which contains all those facts about the whale, you get all these various discursive facts from all sorts of different traditions and and literature and etymology and science and, you know, Linnaean systemization and so forth, all these different facts about the bear, but they're sprinkled throughout the text. And again, as you say, they, they always seem to show up, just slip out at just the right moment, as if especially for her. Mm-hmm. And I really like that comparison you make to that sort of like um, patchwork of quotation that appears at the beginning of Moby Dick, because even though here the quotations are scattered throughout the whole narrative, right? So it's sort of, it, they pop up again and again, you know, throughout the, the story. They serve that kind of um, making sense of the apparent incoherence of the world. Like, in other words, the same way for Ishmael and Moby Dick, right? The, the, the knowledge he gets, the information he gets is a way of kind of controlling and managing this extraordinary oceanic world, right? Here, too, she's trying to grasp something. She's trying to make sense of something. And um, she's using these pieces of paper and the filing and the cards she's producing as a way of inventorying the house, inventorying the books, grasping, like controlling knowledge in some way. But by the end, she sort of realized that this is a fool's errand. That, you know, what is the use of all these cards and details and orderings? Like she understands that this paperwork only gives you so much. And she hesitates over what to do with the notes in the end, which I always think is such a, a, a neat thing, whether to throw them away or keep them. Yeah, because they feel so personal to her, right? yeah. they, especially the way that they just sort of slip out. It's like, oh, this is a this is a message yeah. for me in particular, which it isn't, but it also is, right? I mean, this is you know the the tradition of the bear is being handed down for the first person who who hosted one at, at this site, and it does seem like. The colonel wants his fascination to be carried on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that really gets at some of my, like, discomfort with this book, which I don't mean, like, again, I don't mean it's a bad book, but, like, why I'm so uncomfortable. I mean, it's not the sex. It's that it's, there's all these things that feel incredibly private, and then they're made open and made public. And and I feel like, you know, like, almost like there, there are violations happening. Things that should be private are becoming public. And the notes are, in a weird kind of way, part of that. Like, they seem intimate and personal, but... They're put out there to kind of continue this sort of genealogy of knowledge of the bear, right? And, and and I find that really both fascinating and kind of, like I said, disturbing at the same time. It's interesting you say that. One of the things that I found really interesting was there's a section in which Lou is thinking about her previous life as a journalist, which she sort of gets frustrated with the invasiveness and the ephemerality of journalism. And so she, quote, changed her life in order to find a place for herself in the least parasitic of the narrative historical occupations, meaning working in archives, working in libraries. And yet, how parasitic does it turn out to be? Like, I've, it, it is both more invasive than she imagined or she expected going into it. You know, this becomes incredibly personal. 
and incredibly invasive and, and parasitic in a sense. And also the, the uh, use of the word occupations there is really interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, obviously taking on you know, the meaning of a job, but also as a kind of occupying force, like you're taking over the person's life by writing about it. Yeah. And, and that struck me as a really interesting line of thinking throughout the novel. Uh, not that it dwells too much on it, but this idea of like, what does it mean to be dallying in someone's archives? What does it mean? What what exactly are you looking for when you set up and establish these archives and when you spend time in a place like this house? Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. That whole question of like, what's private, what's public, and how to, to what extent does the archivist kind of carry it almost a kind of a, a colonial kind of act, right? But but the the place where I was feeling this sort of violation of the private was was less in the way the archivist, you know, so Lou deals with the people who were there. Then with the bear, like the bear, like, how can I put it? The bear is at once this potentially violent creature that, that will actually hurt her, you know, at one point, you know, uh, when, when she's finally injured by, by the bear. But it, it's also the fact that it's chained and when it's unchained is because she's chosen to unchain it for a period of time. It's like she, I don't want to say she makes the bear do things, but she creates situations that like the bear's choices are always tremendously constrained by her power over the bear. You know, so the bear is at one and the same time kind of powerful and at the same time, you know, under her thumb, like she's a tyrant relative to the bear. So I, I find that, well, I find that, no, I find that, I find that, you know, I don't know how to make sense of that. I think the other side of that as well is that she vacillates between recognizing the bear as an autonomous thing that will not and cannot share its thoughts Humanly, as, as you said in the open, you know, she says, uh, you're not, you're not a humble beast. You think your own thoughts. Tell them to me. She wants access to the interiority of the bear, but also recognizes that there's a fundamental gulf between human interiority and bear interiority that she doesn't actually expect will be crossed, will be, will be translated. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this desire of hers to make the bear public while also admiring it for its insistent privateness. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, one of the ways that gets mediated, that relationship gets mediated is through, and I found this really interesting, is through smell, the sense of smell, right? The book, did you, did you track that through the, the book too? Like, um, it comes up very early on when she first gets to the place and it sort of has this odd kind of smell. And, and you discover that it's the bear, right? And the way in which she develops a kind of level of confidence with the bear, so the bear kind of trusts her and comes out, is by shitting outside of the place where the bear stays. In that that sort of log cabin shed in the back, because as um, uh, the, the woman who's um, looked after the bear in the past, Lucy, or continues to look after the bear, Lucy says, um, she says, um, "You shit, he shit." Bear lives by smell, right? That there's a kind of knowledge and communication that comes through that, and and it's surprisingly multi layered, right? Because you know the reason you know, why does human shit smell bad, right? Why does shit smell bad to human beings, right? It's it's culturally constructed, right? It's because we have clean and dirty and inside and outside and, right? I mean, for animals, it doesn't work that way, right? It's, there are many smells, right? And they communicate different things. And, and watching the way smell works for Lou throughout this entire book is really interesting because it tracks her affinity with the bear, and when she separates from the bear at the end, the language of like cleanliness that gets used is all about extricating herself, I think, from that sort of sensory system. It's very weird. It's very weird. Yeah, it is weird. She smells a lot of things in, over the course of the book, and not just the bear, but like she has a very heightened, from my, from my you know, poor smelling experience, she has a very heightened sense of scent in general. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she... Um, there's a there's an in particular there's a moment when she sees skyrockets over the water and quote thought she smelled a million roasting marshmallows mm, mm. which is I mean I've never experienced that moment of seeing <laughs> such a thing and thinking I smell marshmallows but she's really in tune with the sense of smell yeah but like with the bear in particular like at the beginning right when when Lucy says this stuff to him about you know the bear lives by smell Lou restrained herself from shuddering right so it's like in other words, it smells gross to her. The, the smell of the bear is the smell of shit, right? It's this gross smell that she, but that changes, right? So, um, uh, a little later on when she experiences the scent of the bear, it, it's like a positive kind of thing. It's a, a, a scent of musk, right? He smelled better than he had before he started swimming, but his essential smell was still there. A scent of musk as shrill as the high, sweet note of a shepherd's flute. 
right? And it's just really neat because, I mean, first of all, the, the distinctive smell of the bear is now not like gross. It's it's the smell of the bear. It's something particular. And also it's like this, um, God, what's the word? You know, a synesthetic kind of moment, right? Where it's smell, but he, she's understanding it as sound. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It is important to her that the bear should have a smell. It shouldn't be a foul smell necessarily. It should be a berry smell, a bearish smell. And there's an earlier moment when she first arrives in the northern area where she's thinking about all of the people who go up north these days and the tradition that everything for outdoors must be soiled and pilled and 40 years old seem to have died except in her. She's the only one who will wear old clothes to go up north, is what she's thinking. But she thought of a man she knew who said it was now impossible to find a woman who smelled of her own self. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which is that same idea of the, uh, it feels like a very 70s idea, but this virtue of smelling not of, you know, nothing, but smelling of yourself, smelling correctly human or womanly even in this case. Well, it's about bodies, right? I mean, whether you're talking about the bear's body or the woman's body or whatever, you're talking about like the smell of bodies. And and again, that framework that we alluded to earlier of 70s feminism is very much part of this. You know, I mean, not to, you know, be all cliched, you know, stop shaving your legs, get rid of your bra and like, stop using antiperspirant, right? But like, but this idea that, you know, like I mean, making fun of it a little bit, things like the books, like Our Bodies, Ourselves, and so on. These were about recognizing and valuing the nature of the body in a way that was understood as very limited by culture up till then, right? When you think about the kind of social norms that were expected, especially for women to police their, I mean, everyone, but in particular women to police their bodies. And this book is really um, of that moment, I think, in, in this respect. Exactly. So she has this appreciation for her own authentic, natural, let's say, in quotation marks, but she probably wouldn't put it in quotation marks, her own natural smell, as well as the bear's natural smell. And 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 the fact that the bear, you know, understands its world more through smelling than anything else, I think, is also an indicator of its naturalness. Yeah, I mean, and 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 it's a it's a mode of transgression that ultimately meets its kind of limit, right? Like toward the you know we get late in the book, um, uh, she she comes to she smells of bear because she's been with the bear so much, right? And um, others smell that as as repulsive, like you know you're from you know a filth that comes from being with animals and not cleaning yourself, right? Um, but there's also a way of seeing this where it's a kind of a level of comfort and shared proximity, right, with the bear. So I guess the reason I kind of dwell on like smell in this book so much is because it's a really powerful, like really visceral language to talk about the nature of the body and body and identity and, you know, and, and how we like ground identity somewhere other than this, this sort of abstraction of the, of the mind, right? Um, it, it, it is. It's, that's, that's a feature of this book. It's uh, again of its moment, but also, I mean, I don't think it's something we've stopped thinking about, especially with regard to human nature, right? And the extent to which we can understand that as part of the animal world. Yeah. I think that also brings up uh, another aspect, which is that she goes to clean herself and wash the bear scent off of her when she is going to be dealing with people from, I, I don't, I guess from town. Uh, she's, you know, she's on an island, but there's a little area that is tourist filled, uh, not too far away. And there is a person that is her contact there, Homer. And she's going to go meet him and she needs to smell appropriate for dealing with others. She, if she smells like the bear, uh, it will be both weird and maybe they'll be a bit suspicious as to what exactly she's been up to with that bear. So she needs to change her scent to fit in. But this also ties in with this notion of, you know, Lou getting away from society for a while, uh, which is, which is very interesting, both the society of the city and everything that that stands for, and then just the society of other people in general and spending long times without other human contact, except, you know, except with the non bodily contact of looking through the archive and thinking about the original Colonel Carey. Yeah. It's and one of the things that's so striking about this book, I think, is that, you know, you don't notice it too much on the surface because the narrative is beautifully crafted, but it's a book that's full of binary oppositions. So it's um, the, the urban environment of Toronto and the extremely rural environment of Northern Ontario. Um, the uh, a binary sense of gender, right, where there's male and female, because her experience with the bear on the one hand is about this other binary of human and animal, but it's also very much about uh, male-female 
right? And, and at least for Lou in her mind, right? And so there's a lot to say about that. But also other binary oppositions that were, again, important in this historical moment in the mid seventies are very much all over here, like nature and culture, um, written and oral knowledge. Like it's just full of those kinds of oppositions. Not that we actually see those oppositions put like, you know, put baldly in that kind of way in so many words, but you see them all over the place in this book. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I guess as I always do (laughs) when encountering binaries, whether the book is looking at third ways, right? Whether there's a way out of the binary. So, for example, she eventually starts talking about men that she's had sex with and been dissatisfied with and felt love for or didn't feel love for. And there's a very quick throwaway line. I mean, she tried other sexual opportunities. Cucumbers she had found on investigating the possibilities (laughs) suggested in Lysistrata were cold. Women left her hungry for men. And he's like, okay, but you know, so we've tried these other options, I guess. And then like, well, there's bear. Maybe there, maybe bear will do the trick. Yeah. I mean, I think it's true that there's a sense in which it's kind of another alternative, but it exposes the extent to which like the sexual encounters of, of different sorts, like they're, I don't want to say they're about determining her identity, but, but they're very much about knowledge. Like, in other words, carnal knowledge is a means to other kinds of knowledge, especially self-knowledge. Because these her descriptions of what those sexual encounters do to her and for her seem to be, you know, either very empty, as in the case of the, the men she talks about that she was with back in Toronto, or, or the man that she's with, she's, she's sexually with Homer at one point in the book, right? That also does nothing for her. She feels nothing, right, emotionally. But with the bear, it's like this transcendent, I don't know, almost, I don't want to say religious experience, but like um, like passionate felicity, right? you know, like where she loves the bear, she has love for the bear, and that never goes away. But there's also... Um, it's not just an orgasmic moment, right? Like the, the stars fall down onto her skin. Like she's just dissolved, you know? Um, and so, so the sexual encounters in this book are doing something with regard to identity and, and self, right? And again, that's part of that whole sort of 70s feminist moment. Yeah. I love, I love the way too she's very wry about 70s feminism. There's this one great moment where she gets this letter from a feminist friend. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's a, her letter, she gets this letter from a feminist friend inquiring why she was not doing research on a female pioneer for an international women's year. She replied on a postcard of a bear cub halfway up a tree that she was having a wonderful time. <laughs> I mean, and it's a great moment because it's hilarious, right? It was great as well. But also, I mean, it, it exposes this gap between, you know, academic ways of thinking about what women's liberation might mean, right? And that's that's what the friend is writing about. and And the thing that the protagonist here, Lou, is doing. Right. Right. Which is being understood as something that's, I guess you could say, pioneering in a different kind of way, right? Like for good and for ill, right? She's like way out there in what she's doing. Yeah. But is it, is it, is, you know what I mean? Like, is it, there's that, that positive sense of pioneering, like going out of the one, then there's that incredibly negative, like eternally settler colonial way of thing. And so I think we're meant to hold both of these things in tension. Like, is she exploiting this world or is she giving herself over to it? Oh, man, there's so much. In all that you just said, and uh, and it's great, and it, and it is that sort of those kinds of pileups of of details that just come in. Like that letter is just a very brief moment in the book, yeah, but it's yeah. a very brief book, and it does weigh heavily on everything else in the book. And that's one of the things that I quite enjoyed about it uh, is how is how Im- impactful, as they say, <laughs> those little moments were. Yeah, no, it's very. Cons- this I mean by being fable like, like it's so concise, right? I mean, it's not a long book, and it's it's. It's tight and beautifully written, and there's so much in it. So I'm thinking about, well, I'm thinking about a few things. I'm thinking about her agency mm-hmm. and how a lot of this book seems to be about her not feeling like she has much agency. There have been seemingly small moments in her past when she's felt like she could do something. She might you know, change her job or something or, or, or start on a new career path. But she hasn't felt like she's had tremendous amount of agencies, especially in terms of love and sex, right? Like she's agency in the sense that, you know, she is, quote unquote, a liberated woman. She's willing to have sex with people as a fling. It's no big deal when she has sex with Homer. She's not expecting it to lead to anything romantic. It's just sex. And that's fine. And that's very 70s approach, right? That that would be a sign of someone liberated. But that's not satisfying her. That's There's something more that she wants than that. Mm-hmm. And when she's, you know, when she's been in a relationship with a man, then it was terrible. <laughs> and, you know, she was eventually left for a younger woman. And 
And so part of the process of the bear seems to be like this rekindling of agency within her. Yeah. And that agency plays out in a really perplexing kind of way, Um, especially at the moments when like big things happen, by which I mean the first time she has sex with the bear and then the time when she gets um, injured by the bear. Right. Because the, I, I was so struck by the language that get you, gets used in the aftermath of those two incidents. Yeah. I think that's worth sort of tracking a bit. Like the first time that she has sexual contact with the bear, the bear's mostly doing it, right? Like they're just sitting by the fire. She's reading. It's a hot day. She's been sweaty and the bear smells the sweat and comes over and. I'll read a few lines of it. So she, she's feeling exactly that sort of unhappiness that you were describing that arises from her earlier life back in Toronto. Um, she says um, she's lonely, inconsolably lonely. It was years since she'd had human contact. Ideas were all very well and she could hide in her work, um, forgetting for a while the real meaning of the institute where the director fucked her weekly on her desk while both of them pretended they were shocking the government. Um, she allows it to go on, but she's just really unhappy, right? And, and so she's, she's sad, right? She, oh, oh, bear, she said, rubbing his neck. She got up and took her clothes off because she was hot. She lay down on the far side of the bear, away from the fire and a little away from him, and began in her desolation to make love to herself. And the bear notices this and, and licks her, right? Um, and then that goes on. He licked, he probed. She might have been a flea he was searching for. And it goes a little further. With little nickering, she moved him south. She swung her hips and made it easy for him. Bear, bear, she whispered, playing with his ears. The tongue that was muscular, but also capable of lengthening itself like an eel, found all her secret places. And like no human being she had ever known, it persevered in her pleasure. When she came, she whimpered, and the bear licked away her tears. It's like, whoa! Yep. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's it's shocking, and I think it's meant to be shocking, right? But then it's so layered, right? She's got this relationship with the bear. Like she loves the bear and that always continues, right? She's scratching it affectionately by the ears. I mean, that relationship never goes away, but there's also this other thing that's happening. This, this yearning that she has, which the bear fills, right? And, and, and in different ways, right? The bear licked away her tears and the bear is described in the earlier parts of the book over and over again in terms of sadness and grief. Like it has eyes that communicate sadness and grief and so on. And here it's sadness and grief expressed in the form of the tears, but now it's her tears that the bear licks away. So there's just so much happening there. Um, and then the aftermath, right? Where she's just has to figure out what to do with what happened. Well, it's interesting to think in that moment first, before we get to the aftermath, about how much agency she has in this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, she chose to get naked and she's starting to, you know, she's starting to make love to herself, as it says, and then it approaches and then she does eventually guide it down. But there's also an interesting line in there, you know, she's getting licked and she's thinking about the sensation and then she thinks about something she'd been reading about just before this all started out, about Lord Byron, the poet. And what the hell did Byron do with his bear, she wondered. And Byron is known for a number of things. One of them is that he had a bear, uh, which he took to university with him, which has been mentioned in the book already. And the other one is that uh, he he had sex with everything. Mm. He was he was very libertine and experimental in what he would have sex with. And so, like, is that an indication that that's where her mind is already going? Like in this moment that she's, she's, you know, thinking, how far can I push this already? What would Byron have done? What would that be like? And yeah, and again, agency, right? Like, is she doing this? Is he doing this? I mean, the bear is licking her, right? But she's, you know, with little nickering, she moved him south. She's had this idea about Byron. She's been been reading this biography of Byron. Yeah, yeah. And like, is she, and, and feeling overwhelmed by the book as well. So is it like, is it a sort of literary intoxication pushing her towards this? Yeah. I mean, so where did this come from, right? And this this un- lack of clarity about agency is it persists when, like in the aftermath, in the morning, she wakes up in the morning, she felt as if she had neglected something. What didn't I do? Oh, dear. What did I do? Yes. Um, I was reading Trelawney, getting high in Trelawney, feeling I tracked down the mentality. Then I, the bear, sweet Jesus, what a strange thing to do, to have done, to have done to one. And, and, and you know what I mean? In that moment, it's just like, you know, what's the subject? What's the object? Who's the agent? Who's active? Who's passive in this situation? And, and it's, that's part of what makes me very uncomfortable with this book. Cause I'm like, you know, that bear, man, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, not in that moment, but I mean, in general. Yeah. That bear right? and her, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like she, like agency is going to be a complicated thing. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, I and think, it happens again when she, the bear injures her. It's a, a, again an issue of agency. Yeah, I think this book does a really good job of capturing that complication of agency. How much agency do we have in so many of the encounters that we that we participate in? Is the 70s answer of, well, we just need to own our agency, is that enough? Is the 70s feminism answer of, of we just need to own our agency enough? Or is agency always going to get complicated and muddied by situations by by other things that are laying are, that are happening to us um the book seems to be unsure well it's playing it out i think in a very particular way with regard to a binary concept of gender yeah right so what does it mean for women to be strong right what does it mean for women to be active right in in, in an environment in which there's a set of binaries that govern expectations. Like what, what happens then, right, with those binaries? And um, that plays out in all different kinds of ways in her relationship with the bear. Um, and the the violence of the bear, like she wants, I mean, she uh, later on when she has, she as you say, the, when you were doing the summary, right, like she, um, she and the bear are going to have sex, right? Like they've had different kinds of sexual relations, but he's never penetrated her before. Right. right? So there's a kind of, there's, it's clear that there's, a, we're coming close to the end of summer. And it's also clear that she's a, a reminded again of the danger in, in, of in physical intimacy with the bear. Um, she wiggled closer to him, closer until he encompassed her. He moved a leg and nearly broke her arm. She'd forgotten his great weight. And she says, it's over now. She says to him, she says, it's over. You have to go to your place and eye to mine. She sat up and put her sweater on. And then he's confused. And then he has an erection. Which is like the first time that he's had an erection around her. Exactly. So this happens. And then she took her sweater off, right? I mean, that's like- She's like, been waiting for this moment. Yeah, right? And went down in all fours in front of him in the animal posture. He reached out one great paw and ripped the skin on her back. At first, she felt no pain. She simply leapt away from him turned to face him he had lost his erection and was sitting in the same posture she could see nothing nothing in his face to tell her what to do so like that moment um of first sexual intimacy that they have this is like an intimate moment and a transgressive moment but it's a moment of rupture right and it's going to result in the same confusion with regard to um who who has done what right and so the next morning she's sort of stuck to her sheets by the blood on her back and then she remembered it was day the light was streaming in she was lying stuck to the bed in full daylight unable to raise her left arm something had happened that christ have mercy on us the room she lay in was dirty her hands were dirty how long have i been like this she wondered right so it it, it it's it's this moment of confusion, but also something had happened, right? And this question of what it is that happened, like that's very 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 multi layered, right? Yes, she 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 understands herself to be dirty now. I mean, that I think is perhaps one of the biggest things that's happened. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, she has, and, and that she has been dirty for a while, and that the room is dirty, which yeah. it, it would be if the bear comes in all the time. But that she hadn't noticed it before. And, but and, and in fact, had explicitly, like the language of cleanliness gets used to talk about her relation with the bear and her sense of being with the bear. And so, when the language that, of, of it being dirty comes up, all of a sudden, you know what I mean? She's she's just shifted. She's human again. I guess is what I'm saying. And he's bear, right? He's animal. And and they're separate again. Yeah. She's she's woken up, so to speak, from this reverie with this act of violence from from her lover, from her putative lover, who who doesn't go on to further maul her or anything, just does this one moment. And there's no explanation that can be given for exactly why he did that at that moment, right? This is a bear. It doesn't open up for human-esque explanation or reasoning and it doesn't even ruin their relationship i mean they're still they're still close right so afterward um uh you know they continue to be close right that next night they they lie beside one another um lapped in his fur she was wrapped in a basket and caressed by little waves the breath of kind beasts was upon her um so there's there, so they're, they're still close right but they're proximate now as opposed to together you yeah. know what I mean? Like they're together, but there's a space. Well, and she's going to leave now. <laughs> she's going to leave, and um, and and there's this really weird moment, like one of the many moments I ended up marking with question marks in this book, right? <laughs> um, she 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 knows she's been changed by her time with the bear. She knows time with the bear is coming to an end, and she knows that she's different now. 
Right. So what had passed to her from him, she did not know. Certainly it was not the seed of heroes or magic or any astounding virtue, for she continued to be herself. But for one strange, sharp moment, she could feel in her pores and the taste of her own mouth that she knew what the world was for. She felt not that she was at last human, but that she was at last clean, clean and simple and proud. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. You know, I mean, it's like, so I'm not part of that world. Like I've encountered that world and now I know what I am, which is, which is, which is not that. Mm, right. Mm. And, and I'm like, I find myself troubled by that without understanding why I'm troubled by it. Yeah. I don't quite know what to make of it either. Definitely. <laughs> um, and I don't even know if I fully trust it. Right. Like mm. it, it's the, it's the sort of the clean break of a moment when something feels like it's going to be all new. And it's sort of like the feeling that she experienced when she, you know, arrived here. There was a moment when she, when she goes north, when she describes, you know, sort of leaving the, the city, leaving, leaving the edge of Toronto as crossing the Rubicon. And then starting to feel free upon that moment. It's, it feels like it's that same thing where, where like we are now entering a new stage. Yeah. And therefore suddenly she feels clean and fresh and, and removed of the responsibilities and the life that had been starting to weigh down upon her. You know, she was tired of the Institute. She was tired of living in the city. She got this opportunity to leave the city. She was, had this relationship with the bear. That has come to an end, and now she has the cleanness of being able to walk away from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I don't know whether that cleanness is going to stay with her terribly long, but you know, the book ends. That's the last chapter. She leaves. And and the way that entry into that world and that exit from that world is mediated, it's like so striking that it's through um, these these quote unquote Indian characters, Joe King and Lucy Leroy. Right. Because so here at the end, right, at, right at that moment of um, th- cleanness that we were just looking at together. Um, and so Joe King has come to take the bear back to, to Lucy, to, to his aunt. And they talk a little bit about the bear in connection with her. Um, Joe says, Lucy said you'd get on good with him. And Lou responds, Oh, I got on good with him. He's a fine fellow. And like, if you take that passage along with a passage a little bit earlier in the book where she has a conversation with Lucy and they're, they're holding hands, right. And talking, shaking hands, holding hands and talking. There's this sense in which her encounter with the bear, like her time with the bear is mediated both at the beginning of the book. And then here at the end by the encounter with those people. Right. And I, I, I wonder how to understand that. Like uh, one way of understanding that is in the context of how Canadian national identity and particularly um, Canadian writing, like uh, the literature of Canadians, especially in English Canada, was being understood relative to the indigenous populations. And, you know, whether that involved uh, oral narrative, whether it involved um, interactions on the front in the frontier regions, or uh, to what extent do we have to just read that as a product of that historical moment in the 70s? Or is there a way in which we can think about this as, I don't know, how how we map the world and how we understand our relationship to other living things, right? Whether human or other kinds of animal things. Right? So I guess I guess what I'm wondering is, is there a door that's kind of opened up here to thinking about how we relate to and are part of the animal world that maybe Marion Engel doesn't kind of get all the way open, but that that these are moments where she's kind of bumping up against these questions. And maybe that's why these parts feel so troublesome. You know, she herself is not going to take us through that door, right? But she's like, there's something here. Yeah, I think I think that's probably the most accurate way to put it, is that there's a recognition that there's something here, and that's being parlayed to us by somebody who isn't really investigating what that is. Mm-hmm, 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 and mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. It, it points to things that we might now say, you know, if we've read – indigenous literature if, if, if i mean obviously if we are indigenous we'll have a different relationship to this but for those of us who aren't if we've encountered these ideas in indigenous literature and in writing you know in something like braiding sweetgrass that we talked about you know mm, i find might, myself wanting to go back to monkey beach yeah um, or monkey right? beach yeah, exactly yeah. and we might say oh that is a really shallow conception of that thing that i saw over there yeah yeah but it does yeah. at least point to that other thing that i know about right Right. And therefore, you want to be able to use that as an entryway to, well, Monkey Beach, let's say, or to, you know, a, a version of the book that has thought about that aspect of it a bit more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I don't think that's this book. <laughs> no, I mean, and that's fine, right? Like, we always have to take every book we read, like, you know, 
from its own position and like its own time and what it's trying to do there. Right. And yeah, absolutely. and what it might give us right now. Um, but it makes me really hungry, right. To read other books that kind of push a little bit harder on opening that door. So in particular, uh, thinking, looking, I want to look back at Monkey Beach and I also want to read other books by um, First Nations and Native American indigenous writers who, who are thinking or, and writing about these kinds of questions with, you know, about animals, right? Well, this has been another in our cluster on animals. And I think with that, it's, it's worth thinking about what other books we had considered putting in this cluster and didn't didn't end up making the short list. Mm, what are some of the ones you thought about? Well, the one that I was most excited about until I started reading it <laughs> is E.T.A. Hoffman's novel, The Life and Opinions of the Tomcat Murr. Mm, I do like Tomcats. I do as well. <laughs> and E.T.A. Hoffman wrote a bunch of short stories in German in the early 19th century. He wrote the version of The Nutcracker that was then uh, turned into... Uh, you know, a ballet you might have heard of, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so forth. This is a particularly weird book, and I encountered it on, like, a list of weird books. So Tom Catmer is the name of a self-taught animal who's written his own autobiography. I'm just reading from the back of the book now. Uh, mm -hmm. But a printer's error causes his story to be accidentally mixed and spliced with a book about the composer Johannes Chrysler. <laughs> And so it constantly is jumping between these two stories told in these two different modes at the drop of a hat, like mid-sentence sometimes. And uh, it's a weird idea for a book. And I, I believe if I had read further into the book that the stories would have met in interesting ways. But uh, I got about 50 pages into it and thought, this is interesting, but maybe not interesting enough for this mm. particular. Like, I didn't feel like I was getting anything terribly exciting out of this book. But I now now it's been a little while. I'm curious to go back to it. I don't know. It, it's mentioned in Little Women. They talk about Tom Ketmer at one point. Really? I missed that. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about it. So it, it was just a reference that didn't mean anything to me at that point. But uh, yeah, it totally gets brought up there. It's it's unexpected. Well, I'm going to look for think. that now. Yeah. Anyway, it's a neat idea. I need to go back to it. If you, listener, have read it and have interesting things to say about it, please write in. I'd love to hear them. Uh, are there any other animal-related books that you were thinking about? Well, one that was in the back of my mind, and I and I hope we do end up talking about it at some point in some other cluster, is um, Marie de France's Lays. Mm. So she's a uh, a writer, either either living in northern France or in England in the 12th century, writing in French, um, attached or connected in some ways to the court of Henry II, and and she leaves behind a few different sets of a few different collections of writing. And one of them is called the Lays. And a lay is like a sort of short, as you know, right, is a short, short fable or like a little, little, little story um, written in verse, right, narrative verse, um, very beautifully written. And the Lays are about a whole lot of different things. They, she describes them as being oral stories that she's turned into written form. And she talks about that process. But they also feature animals in all kinds of interesting and weird ways. Um, she also writes this other work called Fables, which is a, a translation adaptation of sort of Aesop fables kinds of things, um, you know, so animal stories. So um, so reading the lays with an awareness that she's also written the fables is really interesting and thinking about like what animals mean, how animals can be used to ventriloquize other kinds of human thought and so on. Um, that's kind of thing. But the reason the lays are so neat with regard to animals is that, um, how can I put it, uh, animal natures in the natural world more broadly are very much part of, I don't know if you want to call it magical, but the, the sort of supernatural that is always imminent in in the regular world. So things like, um, you know, a swan that is actually a man, uh, a man who's changed into a, a werewolf. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just like all these kinds of bodily metamorphoses that involve animal and human natures, they're all over the lays. So that's something that was in my mind, but I thought it, it might be also fun to talk about that in connection with metamorphosis or some other kind of theme. So it didn't need to be in an animal cluster. Yeah, I know. The, the lays are delightful. Do you, do you have a favorite one if somebody wants to check out their first Marie de France lay? Uh, well, I can, it's one that I would recommend as a, you know, sort of uh, gateway lay. And then there's one that's my favorite. My favorite is Chevrefeuille, uh, which is about honeysuckle and sort of signs in the woods. It's very short. But um, one that I would recommend as a kind of, you know, entryway one, it's a little bit longer and it's sort of uh, an Arthurian one. It, it refers to King Arthur, um, is L'Enval, which is, um, it's very beautiful, poignant kind of lay that gives you a sense of um, there being a, a, a other world uh, just at the borders of this one. And you can sort of pass between this world and that one. 
Um, so that's the one I would recommend. Yeah. We'll definitely find an excuse to do Marie de France sometime. Yeah, she's great. She's terrific. So listeners, also, if you have a book that you're excited about that you think could have been part of this conversation about animals, please write in and suggest it to us. Uh, you can write to spouter at megaphonic.fm or tweet us at the spouter or, you know, any number of ways you might find to uh, get in touch with us. But we'd absolutely love to hear uh, and uh, we'll pick some out and read them aloud on the next show because, uh, you know, there's more books out there than the two of us know. <laughs> and, or, or, or just thought of, you know, sometimes you don't even realize that a book is relevant to a topic until somebody points it out and you go, oh yeah, that could totally work. So I'm excited to hear what other people have to add. But we should get ready for our next book. Which is Charlotte's Web which many people may know from uh, like animated versions of it, but also others may have read it um, when they were young. It's a, I, we're going back to children's literature, and I'm really excited about doing that because I feel like like th there's one way of talking about it when you think about reading it as a child or reading it to a child, and then it functions on a whole different level um, when you take it outside of that. Charlotte's Web is one of those children's books that everyone has read that I managed to never read as a child. <laughs> I have read a little tiny bit of it to my nephew at one point, at the ending. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I got to like be there with my nephew while he while cried. He wept. Cause, yeah, because yeah, exactly. he, he, he read it several times already and he knew it was coming, but it was like, oh boy, oh boy, that's fun. Um, Honestly, I, I think you'll like it because E.B. White, you know, is a really good writer. Like they're just the style is really, just the craftsmanship. I think at the very least you'll enjoy that. Oh, sure. And I mean, certainly I enjoyed what little I read of it, even though <laughs> I didn't fully have, I mean, I, I, I've seen them, I think I've seen the animated cartoon, but... Um, it's meh. Sure. It's fine. I remember, it's fine. I remember, I remember <laughs> some of it sticks in the memory, at least, uh, which is all that we can ask of, you know, art sometimes. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm super excited to read this uh, as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Until then, though, if you, listener, would like to get in touch with us, as I said, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd always love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 46. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.